And today, Peter is again offering us food for thought and is going to be reflecting on the ongoing legacies of the transatlantic slave trade. Today's session is being recorded and it will add to a bank of resources to encourage and equip our church and our members individually to embark on a journey from being not racist to anti-racist, whatever our starting point along that journey might be. I am a con the convener of the Legacies of Slavery Task Group. Um, and we thought it might be wise at this stage to give you a little bit of an update as to what's been going on and what is going to go on in Legacies of Slavery. Um, it, we've been uh, working on, on this topic for um, about a year. Um, we presented uh, our response to the uh, CWM's uh, range of activities focusing on the legacies of slavery and we presented our um, findings to Mission Council and, and got the support of Mission Council to um, take some actions forward. We're, we're really looking in four areas. So the first is understanding history. We've done some analysis on uh, the, the history of the United Reformed Church and its predecessor churches are, and their direct links to slavery, but actually want congregations to look at their individual histories uh, and what their links to um, those who have profited from enslaving black people. The second thing we're looking to is an apology. Um, part of the healing needs to start with understanding, and if you understand Firstly, that the legacies of slavery, of transatlantic slavery, are here and with us and alive and kicking today, even though transatlantic slavery itself ended in the 1860s. The legacies never did end, and if anything, are stronger. So that understanding and our role in, those, in perpetuating those legacies of um, whiteness, or white superiority, supposedly, and the racism that, that becomes part of that, uh, recognizing our understanding of in that demands an apology. So the second thing we're thinking about is um, how and if and when the URC should make an, a, a corporate apology. The third thing is that we're looking at is understanding that uh, an apology which is cost free is very thin and weak. Um, and therefore some form of restorative justice is an essential part of an apology. And then the final area that we're looking at is uh, understanding whiteness and, it, and the way it infiltrates the processes and procedures and policies of the United Reformed Church. We'll be pointing you to YouTube clips, uh, articles, um, movies, um, um, house group materials and Bible studies. Um, uh, so there'll, there'll be a wealth of materials to, to help people start that in preparation for a year of consultation with the whole denomination, which will kick off, we think in General Assembly 2021, with the aim to have in our Jubilee year, which is a fantastic year to do it, in our Jubilee year in uh, General Assembly 2022, where we will vote on, um, I hope, a suitable apology and the beginning of a program of restorative justice and a deep investigation into eliminating uh, white supremacy within the United Reformed Church. Thank you. I can honestly say I'm excited to hand over to the Reverend Dr. Peter Crutchley, Peter is a URC minister currently working with the Council for World Mission in the role of Mission Secretary for Mission Development. He has been the driving force between CWM's Legacies of Slavery project. The ensuing report and recommendations from that project, it's a living document with which the URC is actively engaging at the present time. But Peter, what do you have for us today? I'm handing over to you. Thank you so much, Karen. Welcome. Um, thank you for the welcome and to uh, see friends here again today. Uh, certainly on behalf of Council for World Mission, we want to thank 
you and share our excitement that you are responding um, both to the legacies of slavery um, findings as well as more deeply the questions of um, addressing how to be an anti-racist church. So we're excited to see where this is going and want to learn from the work you're doing as well. So please do keep us engaged and, and connected. So my plan uh, today, friends, is having last week shared some very personal reflections on being white uh, when Black Lives Matter and some biblical um, reflections on being white. I want to share some historical and missiological um, reflections. So I'm going to use PowerPoint and share screen and so you can see some of the things I'm going to try to speak to and hopefully that will um, enable us into the wider conversation that will follow. So I would just begin with a kind of very bland statement, let's say, that I guess for many of us, we understand mission, the impulse behind mission as being something to do with Christianity is good for you. And that's the impulse because through Christianity, you can receive healing, forgiveness, love, or you can receive socialization to a particular worldview and understanding which says you are a flawed and damned human being unless you take on a particular ecclesial identity, unless you're born again, unless you're baptized. Our mission impulse is to confirm the inadequacy and in some cases inhumanness of other people and offer them the solution, the healing, Jesus, Christianity. And whilst we say it's Jesus, we really mean it's Christianity because it really fundamentally boils down to come to church. And not just any church, come to our church. And not just any of those churches of our churches, but my specific church in my specific way. Christianity is good for who? So that's an important question to be reflecting on, particularly in the stories I'm going to, to share with you. Because really, Christianity is good for the church. So let me tell you some stories from our uh, organization, Council for World Mission, London Missionary Society, as it once was. This is uh, William Alice Hankey. He was the treasurer of the London Missionary Society. And he was a banker. He had the Hankey Bank. And the Hankey Bank was the personal bank for London Missionary Society. And all the money that uh, was raised through congregations that we belong to, that was given to the London Missionary Society, went through the hands of William Alice Hankey and the Hankey Bank. He was invited to um, speak to the uh, Select Committee for the Abolition of Slavery um, of Parliament um, in 1832. And they asked him a key question. They asked him, as a result of your experience as treasurer of the London Missionary Society, led you to the conclusion from the, from the progress of civilization among the slaves that when instructed, they have become more obedient and tranquil. This is what Hankey says. Quite so. I believe their value, even in the market, has risen in proportion as they have been so instructed. Do you want me to read that to you again? <laughs> Quite so, says the treasurer. I believe their value, even in the market, has risen. Do you want me to explain which particular market Hanky is talking about? A slave has been regarded as more valuable in consequence of his being instructed by the missionaries of our own and other societies. Christianity was very good for William Hanky. He owned a plantation in Trelawney, in Jamaica. And any of you who are connected into the United Church of Jamaica and Grand Cayman will know that Trelawney is a big heartland in the life of that church and our shared history. And Hanky owned the Arcadia plantation and with it 300 enslaved African people. That's why he's concerned about the market. And that's why Christianity was good for him. And when, after following emancipation, when it was, there was a discussion about compensation, compensation that was paid, of course, to slave owners, not to the enslaved, Hankey made a request and applied in 2019 terms for nearly a million and a half pounds in compensation 
Sadly, bless him, the poor little lamb, he only received the equivalent of £630,000. Christianity is good for William Hankey. Now here is one of our uh, rock star uh, missionaries of the London Missionary Society. You'll, you'll recognise him, some of you, I'm sure. Uh, David Livingstone. David Livingston is a key uh, hero in the mission movements of, uh, of many people's minds. He started with the LMS, he went on to found his own, of course, because he became too important for us. But his remedy for the ills of Africa was Christianity, commerce, civilization. Christianity was good for Livingston, good for European nations, because the explorer missionaries like Livingston revealed to the European nations the resources that were in the interior of Africa. And up till that point, largely the European nations had focused on the coastal regions, obviously with the transatlantic slave trade uh, in West Africa. But Livingston and others showed there were ways into the interior, and that led the way for the scramble for Africa, the dividing of Africa across boundaries and borders of convenience in the white Western nations, and over which still there are tensions and civil wars because of those uh, boundaries. And don't forget with the scramble for Africa and the Treaty of Berlin and all of that that took place, not only was Africa divided up for the white nations, it was also divided up for the white churches. I want to show you now, we'll spend a little bit of time on this, um, to focus on this, and I hope you can, you can see it in sufficient detail. This is a painting that was commissioned by the London Missionary Society um, in 1915. Um, it's called The Healer, painted by Harold Copping, and it's a resource that Sunday school materials were produced for, and a series of pictures um, which were put into um, many of our churches, I'm sure, maybe some of you even remember seeing it on the wall in your Sunday school uh, class or even using it in, your, in the teaching you gave in Sunday school. It was used extensively in the UK, but it was used extensively around the world in the mission stations. It was produced to um, support the London Missionary Society's medical missions, and you can see the connection, of course, with David Livingston. And in it, you can see this poorly African child with villagers crouching around him, looking down on him in worry and perplexity. Um, and you can see just behind him a little horn, a cupping horn that was used in traditional um, medicine to treat um, conditions like this, as it were, we, we assume. Um, but it's cast to one side because instead of this is, is, comes the white Western missionary and doctor offering all of the uh, healing power, not just of white Western technical medicine, but you can see over his shoulder, all of the healing power of a particularly white Jesus. So you can surely read the, the symbolisms that are here about um, ignorant, benighted, uncivilized blackness and blessed, civilized, tender, caring, healing, whiteness and mission. And this, ironically, um, was also sponsored by the Wellcome Foundation and they have some information about this painting which they, they talk about because the, uh, he, the, the medical kit that this doctor is using was produced by the, the Welcome um, uh, company all those years ago. And so they use it to kind of remind the world their, their commitment to healing as well. The person who is the medical missionary um, is modeled on Stanley, who of course famously met Livingston, Dr. Livingston, I presume. You see how all these things connect up all of these mythologies about mission and whiteness and how they're taught. So imagine you're a small white child receiving your Sunday school lesson 
using this image. Imagine you're a black child receiving that Sunday school lesson with this image. So who is this Christianity good for? <laughs> good question. Be reminded though, that when this painting was being produced and this vision of whiteness was being peddled, white Europe was at war. And the kind of campaigns that were taking place, like this in Ypres, with the gas um, attacks. Ironically, when I was exploring this, I discovered that when the first gas attack took place in Ypres, the battalion that uh, faced it were Algerian, not white, Algerian. This is what white civilization was trying to hide behind the willing uh, work of <laughs> Harold Copping and the London Missionary Society to say, no, 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 this is not what whiteness is all about. Whiteness is about healing power, blessed by God, and you can trust us. Why am I giving you this history lesson? Well, Boris has told us. Um, Caesar Johnson has reminded us that in the light of the Black Lives Matter movement and the statues falling and all of this, that we should not try to edit or censor our past. We cannot pretend to have a different history. The statues in our cities and towns were put up by previous generations that had different perspectives, different understandings of right and wrong. But those statues teach us about our past with all its faults. To tear them down would be to lie about our history and impoverish the education of generations to come. And I think this whole project and any approach we are going to take to be anti-racist is exactly about this. Not lying about our history, but telling the truth. And also not accepting that in the past there weren't different understandings of right and wrong. I haven't got time to show you this and I must not carry it away, but there was a slave Bible produced by an Anglican Missionary Society at the same time as London Missionary Society was active in, in the Caribbean. And they realized that all these references to liberation, freedom, um, uh, especially for slaves in the Bible was rather inconvenient. So they removed it all. And what they ended up doing was removing 80% of the Bible. They knew enslavement was wrong but they were willing to chop up the Bible to pretend it was right. So why are we racist? Because of sin? Whose sin? In my, last presenta my presentation last week, I mentioned that racism is stupid, but it's deliberate and it's constructed. So we cannot spiritualize this answer that we hear people say that we are racist because of sin. We need to own that sin, name that sin, and confess it. Otherwise, where is healing going to come from and reconciliation? And where is the truth going to take us? This is my family. And that baby, hard to believe, that's me. This is my baptism in St. John's United Church in Mufalira in Zambia. My parents were missionaries um, with the London Missionary Society. So you understand that when I talk about this history, this is my history. This is my sin. This is my struggle. And one or two people have sometimes talked about the Legacy Project as if it's my baby. <laughs> It's not my baby. I am the baby of the Legacy Project in one respect. My parents went to Zambia before decolonization, before independence, to northern Rhodesia. Roads, all that, yeah. And were there through independence until 1970. During the lead up to independence, my father was threatened with arrest by the district commissioner because he was going around preaching in the villages that they should take independence, that freedom was a, a right that God off, expected us to enjoy. And so his preaching also formed a part of the movement towards decolonization in, in the villages in, uh, in Kashinda and the rural areas around there in uh, northern Zambia. 
And in, in the years that followed independence and decolonization, there were moves, of course, to ensure that leadership of the church, the United Church of Zambia, became indigenous and was not dominated by white missionaries like my father. And in the lead up to my father's departure, when we moved back in 1970 to live in this house where I now live at the moment, in fact, there was a meeting called of all of the Zambian uh, evangelists um, and ministers and the white missionaries to discuss how to hand power over and hand control onto um, indigenous people to lead and develop their own church life. It was all the usual kind of conversation, as I'm sure you can imagine. But at one point, one of the evangelists stood up and asked my father and the white missionaries one question. He asked them, why did you not love us? Why did you not love us? And if you think that my father was shaped by the healer painting and those sorts of materials to be filled with a vision of the love of God for the world and the presence of Christ for all people in all places, going to take the risk of taking what were then two small children to a place where there was no hospital for 250 miles, driving his Land Rover, driving, riding his, his bike, going in a boat, walking until finally he got to these villages to be asked, why did you not love us? when he had defended independence and all those things. Because, of course, he had not loved his black colleagues. This mission was not good for African people. It was good for white people. And this question is a powerful question to critique our mission urges and instincts and incentives. That what we think is love can, to those who are the objects of our attention, be revealed as quite clearly something else altogether. So I want us to reflect on some questions as we take this forward. Racism is one of the legacies of slavery. The missionaries taught it. This material that Copping's painting shows us is about occupying whiteness just like it's occupying blackness. So if the missionaries are responsible for teaching racism and colonialism, how are we going to heal the wounds we still bear? So you could focus on that. Or the question, why did you not love us? Who else might ask this question of us and the church? Can make the connections, the intersections around this. And indeed to address the question really, is Christianity good for you? Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. Thank you.